On today's Jerusalem Dateline, keeping the pressure on in Gaza as Hamas surrenders continue. Intelligence failures that might have paved the way for the October 7th massacres, plus the return of the Mahdi, the last prophet who many Muslims believe will appear after the Jewish people have been eliminated. Following the money, millions of dollars flowing into U.S. colleges and universities, fueling anti-Semitism and anti-Israel sentiments, and witnessing the ashes of Kibbutz Be'eri after volunteering there 50 years ago. All this and more coming up on this edition of Jerusalem Dateline. Hello and welcome to this edition of Jerusalem Dateline. I'm Julie Stahl. U.S. National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan met with Israeli political and military leaders in Israel on Thursday. The U.S. was reportedly pressing Israel to shift its military operations to avoid Palestinian civilian casualties. But Israel is not backing down on its military campaign. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu thanked National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan for U.S. support in supplying munitions, blocking U.N. attempts for a ceasefire, and assistance in returning the hostages. But Sullivan pressured Israeli leaders to shift from all-out war on Hamas by airstrikes and ground assaults in Gaza to more targeted operations. This amid a growing rift between Israel and the U.S. over civilian casualties wrapping up the war and the future of Gaza. He did talk about um, uh, possible transitioning from what we would call high intensity operations, which is what we're seeing them do now, to lower intensity operations uh, sometime, you know, in the near future. But I don't want to put a timestamp on it. I think you can understand that the last thing we'd want to do is telegraph to Hamas what, uh, what they're likely to face in coming weeks and months. President Biden emphasized protecting civilian lives while continuing the campaign against Hamas. I want them to be focused on how to save civilian lives, not stop going after Hamas, but be more careful. Today, Sullivan meets with the leaders of the Palestinian Authority to discuss its role in the future of Gaza and the region. Israeli President Isaac Herzog said security is first and foremost in future negotiations. I truly believe in a horizon of peace. I believe it's feasible. But before getting there, we have to deal with some core issues, the behavioral mode of our partners, and how do we secure the safety and well-being of Israelis and Palestinians. Israel's ambassador to the UK, Tsipi Hotaveli, went a step further, telling British broadcaster Sky News there's no negotiating with Hamas and no chance for the two-state solution that was laid out 30 years ago in the Oslo Accords. I think it's about time for the world to realize the Oslo paradigm failed on the 7th of October and we need to build a new one. The reason the Oslo Accords failed is because the Palestinians never wanted to have a state next to Israel. They want to have a state from the river to the sea. As the fighting continues, the IDF says dozens of Hamas terrorists are surrendering. Instead of pictures that we're used to seeing of military parades, we saw pictures of dozens of terrorists, today included, coming out of their hiding place in the hospital in Jabalia with raised weapons and giving themselves in for interrogation by the IDF forces and the General Security Service. Meanwhile, heightened alert in Europe as German and Dutch officials arrested four suspected terrorists alleged to be members of Hamas in plots to attack Jewish institutions. At about the same time, in an unrelated case, Denmark and the Netherlands arrested four others suspected of terror-related offenses. In Israel, people celebrated the last day of Hanukkah with prayers and memorials for the hostages. In Jerusalem's old city, Hanukkiahs were lit for each of the more than 130 hostages. Rabbi Moshe Zeldman said lighting the candles is like sending up a flare, an SOS to God. News reports indicate that Israeli intelligence officials had advanced knowledge of Hamas's plan for October 7th, and they dismissed it as unrealistic. Chuck Holton reports from Jerusalem on this critical failure. October 7th, Hamas launched an attack resulting in 1,200 fatalities, marking a significant oversight by Israeli intelligence. 
Despite having a detailed 40-page operation plan named Jericho Wall, according to the New York Times, Israeli authorities underestimated Hamas's capabilities, dismissing their plans as overly ambitious. Obviously, this is the worst intelligence failure in the history of the state of Israel. It's one of the worst intelligence failures, it seems, in the history of modern warfare, humanity, or states. And obviously, there will be an accounting held, but right now, Israel seems across the board overwhelmingly sure of their political pressures and their voices, but overall seems to be united in the understanding that right now there is an existential enemy outside trying to destroy the people of Israel, the state of Israel, the Jews. The attack reportedly mirrored Hamas's strategic plan, a combination of rocket barrages and drones aimed at crippling security systems along with gunmen using diverse transport methods successfully breached Israeli defenses. Any objective listener or observer is going to agree that, yeah, it was an intelligence failure that the enemy could plan and organize that many thousands of fighters to breach in 30 different breach points, come through the fence and do that kind of damage. However, yes, Intelligence services collect a lot of intelligence, and, and it's hard to determine what is perfect and accurate intelligence versus what is conjecture. But this isn't the first time Israel has had to overcome these challenges. Now at sunrise on June 7th, Israel's military command ordered the paratroopers to take the city. They advanced through the Lion's Gate and encountered fierce house-to-house -house combat along the way. That morning, soldiers reached the western wall of the Temple Mount, the holiest place in Judaism. In nearly 20 years of Jordanian rule, no Jew had been allowed in the area. The Israelis have a long history of overestimating their capabilities against their enemies and underestimating the threat when it comes to the Arabs specifically. In both the 1967 and the 1973 wars, the Israelis almost lost their country because they didn't pay attention to the warning signs that were everywhere. And that should have served as a lesson in this war with Hamas. But unfortunately, they fell prey to the same hubris this time as well. So yes, there might have been indications, warnings a year before. The fact is, we know this because the, 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 the players involved have said so. I had these, some operations orders translated uh, they were done by people who were Syrian, by Egyptians, and by people in the UAE. And every single one of those guys said, this operations order is the way Persian people talk. So I think a lot of this might have been planned in Iran. The aftermath of the attack raises critical concerns in how Israel identifies and reacts to credible threats. Israel knew about some of this information, but they considered it aspirational. When you think about it, this seemed like such an off-the-wall attack. You're using hang gliders and so on. Who would have thought of that? And who wants to be the guy that puts their career on the line and says, hey, guess what? Uh, Kusam is going to attack with hang gliders. Before they spend any effort on deciding who to blame, however, Israel needs to win the war. It has to go way past that. And, you know, contra the pressure coming up from the world to create a, a state governed by the Palestinian Authority, which is no less genocidal, no less evil than Hamas. Uh, there needs to be a complete change in how Israel relates to those hostile populations that surround it. Chuck Holton, CBN News, Jerusalem. Up next, the plan to eradicate all Jews, which some Muslims believe will make a way for the appearance of Mohammed's last prophet. The attack by Hamas on Israel was only the first phase of a long-term plan by Iran to wipe out the Jewish state. Iranian leaders believe Israel must be eliminated before the return of an Islamic figure known as the Mahdi. Dale Hurd has the story. Iran has been indoctrinating its fighters throughout the Middle East in the belief that Israel is the biggest obstacle to the return of the Mahdi and that there must be an apocalyptic war that destroys both Israel and Jews around the world. Islamic expert Raymond Ibrahim. So the Mahdi, as, as an English speaker would pronounce it, it's really Mahdi, which basically means guided. So he's the guided one, or in Islamic understanding, he's the rightly guided one. And he takes on different guises, depending on which sect of Islam you ask, Sunni or Shia. Sunnis, the majority of the world's Muslims, believe the Mahdi has not yet been born. The Prophet said, Hadith is in Abu Dawood, a man shall come towards the end of times. His name will be my name, 
and the name of his father will be the name of my father, meaning Muhammad ibn Abdullah. Shia Islam, which is dominated by Iran, teaches that the Mahdi is already alive and has been hiding for over a thousand years. Brother Rashid, a former Muslim, hosts a Christian program for Muslims called Daring Questions. The Shia Muslims, uh, especially the Twelver Shiism, they believe that he is the twelfth Imam and he was born around 868, so he just disappeared. He's still alive until today. His age is 1155, if you want to. So he's still living somewhere. And um, one day he will show himself. Muslims in Iran believe the Mahdi is hiding in this well in the mosque of Jamkaran. Pilgrims peer down the well with flashlights, leave prayer requests for the Mahdi and hope he will reappear. Muslims believe that when the Mahdi returns, he will be accompanied by Jesus, known in Islam as the Prophet Isa, to rid the world of evil. Iranian leaders have seized upon belief in the final battle before the Mahdi's return to motivate its military and allies to fight harder to destroy Israel. And a lot of the, you know, Islamic schools or jihadists are being indoctrinated by by Iranian propaganda in in Mahdism, and again, it always centers around Israel and attacking and destroying Israel. Some believe in the next phase of its plan to wipe out Israel, Iran might initiate a multi-front attack through its heavily armed proxy armies in Lebanon, Syria, and Iraq. Ibrahim and Brother Rashid say the doctrine of the Mahdi's return means that any attempts by Israel to make peace with the Muslim world will ultimately prove to be futile. Israel is a threat to Muslims, to the Mahdi, to the coming of the Mahdi Saudi, they have to be eliminated. There is no, no other solution. So I don't think Israel could ever have permanent peace unless Islam were to completely change itself and become not Islam, to be something completely different. And Ibrahim worries that Iran might be willing to use a nuclear weapon against Israel to ensure the return of the Mahdi. Dale Hurd, CBN News. In the U.S., billions of dollars in foreign cash is financing anti-Israel instruction and protests on college campuses. The funds are coming from an unusual combination of Islamist and left-wing sources, and they're turning young minds against the Jewish state. CBN's Gary Lane tracks the money trail. U.S. colleges and universities are swimming in pro-Hamas, anti-Israel cash. Dr. Rachel Ehrenfeld is the founder and president of the American Center for Democracy and the Economic Warfare Institute. She contends Saudi Arabia and Qatar are buying influence by sending billions of dollars for research to American colleges and universities. She believes this funding radicalizes young student minds through classroom instruction. They brought in uh, Palestinians, uh, radical Muslims, Muslim Brotherhood, in order to change the curriculum. The professor who was teaching the subject, addressing it from his point of view, and falsifying, actually, history. Charles Asher Small of the Institute for the Study of Global Anti-Semitism and Policy explains that 75% of Middle Eastern donations come through the Qatar Foundation. The royal family and foundation are closely allied with the Muslim Brotherhood, the movement that birthed Hamas. The ruling uh, royal family of Qatar has an oath with the Muslim Brotherhood. The Muslim Brotherhood is a reactionary, political, Islamist, social movement and the, the Muslim Brotherhood believes in destroying democracy, killing Jewish people, subjugating women, and weakening the West. In a seven-year study of foreign funding to American universities, Small's group found that in recent years, nearly $5 billion flowed from Qatar to American institutions of higher learning. They include major universities like Texas A&M, Georgetown, Cornell, Carnegie Mellon, Northwestern, and Virginia Commonwealth. He believes the money specifically going to Texas A&M poses a national security threat to the United States. Qatar owns all of the intellectual property right for 502 research projects funded by them at Texas A&M, including research that is connected to its nuclear research program at Texas A&M. Texas A&M is one of three universities with a research nuclear reactor. 
There's also the growth of anti-Semitism on campus coming from pro-Palestinian groups like Students for Justice in Palestine. According to the Anti-Defamation League, the SJP is a leading organizer of the boycott, divestment and sanctions movement. The ADL states it, quote, specializes in using confrontational tactics, such as disrupting student-run pro-Israel events. The group reportedly works closely with the Jewish Voice for Peace, which according to the Washington Free Beacon has received $650,000 since 2017 from the George Soros Open Society Foundations. Soros has also reportedly given California's Tides Foundation, a group advocating social change and immigrant children's rights, at least $3.5 million to support student protests, similar to this one at San Francisco's Balboa High School. Giving instructions to high school uh, students what to chant and what to yell during the demonstration. So what do we do to change the prevailing anti-Israel, anti-Semitic attitudes on U.S. college campuses? Alumni of these universities should stop giving money, period. They actually, they betrayed uh, the whole American, American way of life, American values, American constitution, education, too. Members of Congress are getting involved to limit the influence of foreign money on colleges and universities. The House recently passed the Deterrent Act, which now heads to the Senate for consideration. But it's unclear if there are enough votes for it to pass. Gary Lane, CBN News. Coming up, visiting sacred ground where Israeli citizens lost their lives in their own communities. People are now visiting some of the sites of the October 7th massacre out of respect for the victims who lost their lives. Regent University Dean Michelle Bachman recently went to Kibbutz Be'eri, and for her, it was personal. As Hamas invaded Kibbutz Be'eri, Lotan Pinion watched the attack unfold as he visited the kibbutz website and WhatsApp group that October 7th morning. People started to write, there are terrorists inside the kibbutz. And you start to see on the kibbutz map that they here, 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 here. They are spread all over the kibbutz. A short time after, Pinion learned terrorists slaughtered his mother and father-in-law. And then he would see death and destruction all over their neighborhood. We have 90 murders. 289 houses are either burned or severely damaged. All of this weighed on former Congresswoman Michelle Bachman because she lived here in 1974. I came here the day after I graduated from high school. I'd never been to Israel. It was my first time to come to Israel. And I lived and worked here at Kibbutz Berry. I remember it. It was a happy home where 1,200 people lived. And people wouldn't believe this. There's the whole roofs are missing, and RPGs were fired through the sides of houses, and no one could ever live in these homes again. They're completely totaled, and so they all have to come down. It'll it all have to be destroyed. On this tour of Be'eri, she also learned that people she knew were among those raped and murdered. Horrible. I, I just was devastated. It's incredible to think that human beings would come and do this kind of damage just to get to Jews. The hatred for Jews is so vitriol. They would even burn a house down so they could watch a Jew jump out of a window so that they could shoot them. And uh, the horror is that about 80% of the people who were killed here were tortured. So this is as devastating as it gets. My ch children used to play and visit here each day. These are people's homes. This isn't supposed to be a battlefield. This is where little children rode bikes and went to see their grandparents. All of this neighborhood was full of children that was playing football at the afternoon because all the grandmothers and grandfathers used to live in this neighborhood. No one left, only three people. It's the bodies, it's the people, the life that's gone, and that's irreplaceable. All of our kids have friends that either killed or kidnapped. Bachman believes there should be no mercy for murderers who did this and who promised to continue the slaughter until there are no more Jews here and all of Israel becomes Palestine. Well, this is Israel's land, and Israel has every right to the land, biblically, morally, legally, 
from international law, 100%. This is Israel's land. There's no question. It's not even a doubt. And so this fantasy that different terror groups have, that they're going to kill Jews, because for them it really isn't about land. It's about killing Jews. And so the Jewish people can no longer be expected to wonder if tomorrow is another Holocaust, because that's what this is. You're looking at the Holocaust in our day, and we said never again, and it happened again. And so the only answer is that Israel doesn't have to be the people who suffer from these terrorist acts. If any people group, they should not be the ones forced to live next to the people of Gaza. There are 56 other Arab nations out there who could take in the Gazans. Not one will take them. Why should Israel, the focus of their hatred, be forced to live side by side? That's, the, it needs to end. Paul Strand, CBN News, reporting from Kibbutz Be'eri. Still ahead, showing support for the Holy Land and keeping Israeli small businesses alive. Since the war between Israel and Hamas began, Few visitors are willing to come to the Holy Land, but as Chris Mitchell reports, local businesses are working to bring the Holy Land to them. Zach Mishriki owns a third generation gift shop in the old city. He offers everything from olive wood nativity sets to ancient coins and oil lamps. Well, I want to communicate the biblical truth or the biblical stories, things that were found in our Bible. For example, you know, when I sell the coin from the Jesus time, you know, the coin of the widow's might. This year I made this, two replica coin of the widow's mind. And I put on the top of it, you know, it's your heart that matters, not your money. It's a biblical truth. God cares for our heart. He doesn't need any money. Workers here do, however. So while offering gifts with meaning, Mishriki also supports Christian brothers and sisters struggling during the war. We need people who love Christ to be here it's important that pilgrims, when they come to Jerusalem, they see that this is not only stone or churches, but they can see real people who have experienced God and testify that his tomb is empty. My business allow people to work and to be productive and have food on their table and stay here. That's where Artsabox also plays a role. The Jewish company tries to bring the Holy Land to Christians in North America. Itai Shimmel is the founder. Yeah. Arts is a company that I set up during COVID, and the idea was to connect people to the Holy Land, to yeah. the land of the Bible, in a meaningful way, and at the same time support small businesses and charities in Israel with every box they receive. And it's something which is immersive and something that the whole family can enjoy. Right. An Arts a Box subscription features locally made gifts delivered four times a year. Now, during the war, Schimmel says it's more meaningful than ever. Because these boxes are directly supporting businesses and charities all over Israel, all of these businesses need help more than ever before. The theme which we chose for this box is Christmas joy. The gifts include a candle holder, prayer journal, and an offering from a company directly affected on October 7th. One has the map of Israel with the Israeli flag, and right. one says Shalom in English and in Hebrew. And this is made by an organization which is in one of the border towns with Gaza. Mm -hmm. And it's an institution that was set up to help teenagers and young adults with Down syndrome, special needs, autism. And they were directly impacted on October 7th. A lot of their employees and their volunteers were brutally murdered. Both Zach's Gifts and Arts Box hope to help keep these local businesses afloat during the war. Chris Mitchell, CBN News, Jerusalem's Old City. What a wonderful way to support Israeli artisans and small businesses. The websites to go to for Zach's Jerusalem Gifts and Artsabox are zachsjerusalemgifts.com and artsabox.com. Well, that's all for this edition of Jerusalem Dateline. Thanks for joining us. Remember, you can follow us on social media and you can access CBN content through our CBN News and other CBN apps. And please remember to pray for the safety of IDF soldiers, all those caught in harm's way, and for the safe return of all the hostages. I'm Julie Stahl. We'll see you next time on Jerusalem Dateline.